Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. Today we're going to be jumping into John chapter 6, verse 1. Hey, we'd like to invite you to join us for our study today. If you um, watching, if you've joined us through our YouTube channel, then you can use the chat area connected with that live stream to let us know what you have to think, ask your questions, submit your thoughts or comments. We'd definitely love to hear from you. If you're on our Facebook page, then you can use the comment section connected with this live video stream. Or if you would really prefer to do it, you can email us, send them to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Questions at truthfactorlive.com. By the way, if you type in truthfactor.com, that takes you to our website. You can also type in truthfactorlive.com. It just will reroute you to truthfactor.com. There you can get access to the most recent video as well as our playlist on YouTube and view the stream live there also. All righty, let's bring everyone in today, or at least most everyone. Uh, we have Tom with us today and Bob as well as Paul. Brian is away on some wonderful, magnificent journey. And Brendan, well, he's busy doing other stuff that's probably important too. So, but it's good to have the four of you guys. Y'all doing all right? Yes, sir. Uh, you mean the three of us guys? Yeah, well, yeah. well, four if you I count myself, gone. you know. Yeah, There's really good. six, me, myself, and I, and you three. Okay. <laughs> are you schizophrenic? We are referring back to high school jokes. Yep. Regressing to that. Um, so we're starting in John chapter 6, verse 1 today. And in this particular account, we're going to see a very, um, a very symbolic miracle. And I think it's very significant as we look through here. And let's see, there was one more thing I wanted to note. Yeah, okay, so what is interesting about this miracle? So there are miracles where Jesus calmed the seas, okay? Then there are miracles where Jesus raised the dead when he restored the sight to the blind and the hearing to the deaf and the ability to speak to the mute, cured leprosy. But in this one, he seemingly, and I think he does miraculously, Lee makes something out of nothing. You know, if, if, if you had five loaves and two fish laying in front of you, there's no way you could make that 10 loaves and four fish or 12 loaves and eight fish just simply by willing it. But through his divine powers, by him being who he is, he's able to do that. And there's a lot of, as I said, symbolism. There's a, uh, there's a lot of meaning to the miracle and we'll talk about that as we go through there um any thoughts kind of a summary thoughts before we jump into our reading here from you guys i thought that was a good summary because uh, it seems like when the miracle is finished that there is more than when they began yeah <clears throat> and yeah. so i think i think that was a good evaluation john oh, well thank you um so let's go ahead and start our reading then and paul if you don't mind we'll start with verse number one and let's see let's read down to verse nine not okay. not a great stopping point but we'll make use of it what what uh, version do you have up there john i have the new king james would you prefer I another do that no okay. that's fine i i have uh, the electronic bible here so i can with a click be where you need me to be so <clears throat> i'll be reading john chapter six verses one through nine after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, 
but what are they among so many? All righty. Appreciate that, Paul. All right, so let's let's talk about a few things here on setting as he sets this up. Now, Paul, I'm going to ask you a question that I don't know yes. if I've, in my 30 some odd years of preaching, I don't know if I've ever caught this. I probably didn't forgot it because you get older. Why do you think John clarified that this is the Sea of Tiberias? Well, I don't know, John. As I understand <laughs> that body had, been, had three names, Sea of Galilee, mm -hmm. Sea of Tiberias, and Gennesaret. Yeah. And so it may be that by this time it was known as the Sea of Tiberias more than it was known as the Sea of Galilee. And so uh, he's a, he's number one educating his his readership if if were necessary and two he's pinpointing in a way that they would understand uh just where this uh where this is taking place right uh, you you know uh, more more than likely this gives us a little bit of an understanding of john's audience it was a it was a broader audience i think uh, i uh, the, you know i mean when you look at matthew mark and luke there uh, we note that they're to specific groups John's is, uh, I don't know if John's is a specific group as much as, I think it's more broad. And so by using the two different names, he's emphasizing, um, he, he, he's emphasizing so that other people understand. There is another observation I think that needs to be made with that statement. The Gospel of John devotes most of its, most of its time to Jesus in Jerusalem. And so now he's in Galilee. If you go to the other Gospels, the Synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, more time is spent in Galilee with occasional trips to uh, Jerusalem. John's the opposite of that. Okay. All right. I, think, I mean, I think it's, it's going to be, I think it's a good point, Tom. And I think we're just looking at the target audience um, and where he was when this happened. You know, as far as what city was he's closest to? You think about the, um, um, was it the Garridans? Sometimes depending on what, what city they were nearest in reference to where they were talking about, some, wouldn't sometimes a city affect what they would call the sea? Maybe. Like yeah. Sea of Galilee or Sea of Genesaret, Sea of Tiberias, kind of the same thing there. But I think, I think you're right. I think it's going to be more related to the audience who's going to be reading this. And maybe later, you know, depending on when we put John writing of this, and like you already said, the, the audience he's addressing there, probably helpful reference. Moses did that a lot, didn't he, when he, when he wrote Genesis? He would reference the sea or a river, I'm sorry. And at some point he would say, which we know today as, or which is known as this and that, so... There's a fellow okay. in the uh, College Press series who wrote a commentary on this. Uh, his last name's Ice. Mm -hmm. And he just says, and he's the only one. Of, I went through several commentaries quickly while I was listening. Uh, he's the only one who even acknowledges, other than that there are several names for this place. And it says, John's Gentile readers uh, knew the lake better as Tiberius. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, exactly right or... or uh, well or not but i think it's reasonable you know and reasonable. that seems to make sense because tiberius <clears throat> tiberius would be a, the name of a uh, of, of a caesar if, hmm? you know, as as opposed to galilee was the location i thought it was probably a reference to captain kirk oh man i was i saw that i wasn't going to say it but you did it thank you paul i appreciate that <laughs> yeah. um and if you now we're going where no man has gone before Oh no! That's... You know, uh, sorry, sorry. Burton Kaufman has this to say: At the time John wrote, near the end of the first century, this was the common name of Galilee, hence the explanation. So by then, it's known as the Sea of Tiberias, and probably because uh, Tiberius maybe was not the Caesar at the time of these events but later became the, the Caesar. And then later the name perhaps was, was changed or redesignated Sea of Tiberius in honor of him. Much, uh, hmm, interesting. much like Macedonia uh, after Philip of Macedon. 
Yeah. And uh, Philippi after uh, an, another great, uh, great person. But uh, at any rate, uh, yeah, there always there's always some reason. And John does uh, explain things. For example, he he explains that this was the uh, the Passover, and then he says a feast of the Jews, uh, and so. People are not as familiar with those things at the time that he wrote as they were perhaps at the time of which he wrote. Writes. And, a and also, larger audience. Also, according to Hendrickson, there's a fourth name for the sea, Chenereth. So Chenereth, Gesenereth, Tiberias, and Galilee. And it's also referred to as both a sea and a lake. Yeah. Lake Ganesser. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We have we have yeah. a member by the name full name is Genesseret. And the way you learn it is by learning the name of the sea here. Yeah. Well let's go ahead and go forward then. Um I just thought that was interesting. And what Bob pointed out about the about John taking the moment to reference Passover as a feast of the Jews. You know, he's writing this, these things are written so that you may believe. And so intended much larger target audience. And sometimes those little, little bitty expl explanations are crucial or helpful in the understanding there. You know, we've already seen our, so back in John chapter one, when Andrew goes to get Peter, he says, we have found Jesus of Nazareth, Messiah. And John says, that means, uh, uh, the Christ. And so yeah. even as, as John chapter one, he is explaining these Hebrew or Aramaic terms in the, uh, in the Greek, in the Greek language, because they wouldn't be familiar. They wouldn't be familiar with the name Messiah, but Christ would mean something that would mean uh, anointed. And so he tells them, you know, it's the equivalent of Christ. That's a good point. Good point. We do have one comment. Just throw it out here real quick. Caleb says Tiberius. Um, oh, let's go back to, there we go. The first comment he sent had to do with what the city was called or the lake was called. May show what side of the sea they're on. And I think that's part of it as well. And then he says Tiberius was a city in Galilee situated on the western side of the lake. Yeah, that makes sense. By the way, I haven't taken a moment to welcome um, those who have specifically signed in. We've got Caleb, we have uh, Chris Kramer is with us today, and Jerry Wilcox is here also, and others. If you have joined us for the first time and you don't mind dropping a comment that says, hey, I'm Bob from Minnesota, or in this case, Bob from Macon, Georgia, um, we'd, we'd love to hear from you, hear from you and to kind of know who is with us there. Okay. So coming back here to the text real quick, we see that Jesus, there's a great multitude followed him because they had seen the signs that he had done uh, in healing those who were diseased. So he goes up to a mountain and there he sat with his disciples. Now, let's point out a while ago, um, it is noted here, the Passover, a feast of the Jews was near. Um, my notes said that this is more than likely the second Passover that John records. That seemed about right. Um, and so, yeah, very much and that would be. mean a year has gone by. You think about it, you know, within a span of six chapters or really five complete chapters, there's already been a year since the preceding Passover. And which means we're more than likely what a year out from his death. I think in there three Passovers that John records, I think there's an unknown feast that he references, but. It's about three and a half year ministry. Yeah. And so, so he's got about a year. Yeah. So about a year and a half before he dies. Yeah. Well, we're talking about this from this point of the second Passover in verse number four yeah. would be about a year left. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we don't always think about that as we read through texts like this, you know, cause John helps us in giving kind of a time marker here. But he's going to be in the last year of his life based on uh, this statement here. And so especially, verse 5. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Mm -hmm. Especially when you get to John chapter 13. Because John chapter 13 through uh, 
through 19 really all deals with the with the last supper and the events afterward yeah As john 13 is where he washes the saints feet and uh and i guess around john chapter 12 maybe the maybe it's john chapter 13 verse 1 the triumphal entrance yep. and so yeah yeah so very little time left for 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 the events between john 6 and john 13. yeah you're right i think you're right so so they saw a great multitude coming and there was a, a, a an issue that philip saw a problem and his question was where shall we buy bread that these may eat now, I thought it was interesting that Philip posed this question. They saw the multitude coming. So did he feel an obligation to feed them? Um, we, all, we understand that Jesus would have compassion on the multitudes, going back to Matthew's account as well. But it's interesting that Philip saw the need to make this observation or more present this question, where shall we buy bread that these hey, may eat? Hey, John, mm -hmm. actually, it's Jesus asking a question. Oh, that's Jesus right. The words in... Yeah, yeah, Jesus the words is asking in red. I Philip known the that. question. What's that? <laughs> the words in red. I should have known that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Bad. You're and, right. Yeah, and I actually have a comment about that. I, 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 I there's an interesting thing about this. Well, and that, uh, but real quick, your point that you're about to make does change completely what we're reading here. The way yes. I present it was all wrong. There's a solid point behind this. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it is interesting. Uh, Jesus is asking Philip, where shall we buy bread uh, that these may eat? And, and, and this is actually one of those passages that gives validity to the fact that the Gospels are independent of each other. There, there's, there's a, a, there is a, a, a type of evidence or, or, or a, an area of evidence is called unde, undesigned coincidences. And basically what that means is you have something that is said in a gospel and it is verified independently by another gospel or it is explained by another gospel you know uh you know for example when you get to the end of the life of jesus and they're looking for two witnesses and oh he said it destroy the temple in three days uh, and then rebuild it again it's interesting that matthew and mark when they say that or matthew and luke it's uh it's not recorded in matthew and luke but john records it in chapter two but what we have here this is interesting is jesus why would he ask philip of all the disciples that are here and there's two passages to consider in this one of them is luke chapter 9 and verse 10 which if you can pop over there real quick i don't know if you have that it's good, uh, you read there the point is made is jesus it says uh, the apostles when they returned told him all that they had done then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. and if you keep reading in the text you come down to verse 12 and you read about the feeding of the five thousand so we establish from this text that where jesus is when he feeds the five thousand is in the region of Bethsaida. Now, the other text to consider is in John chapter 1 and in verse 44. And what you read in that text, it simply states, and if you're, uh, I don't know if you want to mm -hmm. get over there. It, it. It, it simply states, now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So Jesus is asking Philip, where should we go buy bread for all these people? Why would he ask Philip? Because Philip was from that area. Philip would have known the places to go to find bread and stuff. Of course, we know that he's going to miraculously feed them, but he makes the comment to Philip and Philip responds. So I think that's a uh, that's an interesting thing. And and again, what it shows is, uh, you know, in this case, Luke, in this case, Luke and John are independent. They, they didn't, uh, you know, uh, they, they didn't get together in a room and say, okay, Luke, you're going to write it this way and I'm going to write it this way. And we're just going to, we're going to corroborate our stories, uh, you know, that kind of a thing. And, and little things like this help us to understand that. So that's just a little uh, tidbit of evidences. Were you, were you saying it's also the city of <clears throat> Peter and Andrew? 
It does. It 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 uh, that was in John chapter one. Uh, so uh, and it's kind of interesting. Why didn't Jesus ask Peter or John? You know, he turns to Philip, but we know Philip was from this area. You know, it also tells us here in verse six. But he said this to hit to test him, and so maybe it's a case where Philip, in particular, needed to be tested. Uh, the Peter, uh, Andrew, and and Peter did not. And yeah, I don't uh, think the test was whether he knew where the grocery store was either, because uh, yeah, they would have. <clears throat> But maybe uh, to test his character or his uh, to make his faith stronger. Yeah, yeah. But you know, also, put your... oh, go ahead, Bob. Also, I think Jesus is setting the readers, uh, or John, by recording it, and Jesus originally by saying it, is setting the readers up for this. It's like the woman at the well in John chapter four. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jesus says, you know, uh, give me a drink. Yeah. And so here he addresses Peter. So I guess so we can go into the record. Uh, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And he talking to Philip to test Philip and uh, to test his character and, and, and his faith, as it were. That's a good point. Good point. But I've got a, I got a kind of a separate question in all of in all the records of the gospel account with the apostles being and traveling with Jesus, is there ever a time when the apostle sees a problem, like in this case in point, why didn't Philip turn, and I'm being facetious now, but why didn't Philip say, Lord, you don't have to go buy anything. You can just make something for everybody to eat. You know, or, um, when there are other instances, did they ever step forward and offer a miraculous option? The matter of fact, the only time that I remember they did it, Jesus said no. Remember when they um, asked about, uh, was it James and John, about bringing down fire, fire upon the people? They knew Jesus could do that. But it's, it's, it's interesting that some of the, the miraculous solutions that Jesus present were not even anticipated by the apostles. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, and I think that's interesting when you think about, uh, yeah, and you know, we've talked about this, John, seven miracles, and each one of yeah. them is unique. It has unique qualities associated with it, and that's certainly true with this one. This is one of the few that's also mentioned in the other Gospels. I, I think this is this is one of the few that's mentioned in all four Gospels, and uh, 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 we find some qualities, but up to this point. Yes, Jesus had performed all kinds of miracles, but he hadn't done this. You know, I mean, this is going to establish another mm -hmm. another aspect of the lordship of Jesus. Uh, Jesus is Lord of quantity. You know, I think that's one of the descriptions that you have here. The, the, the fact that the fact that he can take two fish, five loaves and just say a prayer. And, and you like like uh, Paul pointed out earlier when they get done eating and they're full and they take up their remains, there's more left over. Uh, uh, I don't know how many fold, but uh, 12 baskets, yeah. Yeah. you know, there's more left over than, than when they started with. So you see Jesus uh, quantity means nothing to Jesus from the standpoint of what he's able to control, you know, and, and of course you've got the spiritual application, which is I am the bread of life. Uh, trust in me and I can feed you what you need spiritually. Yeah. I think you know, Tom I makes, uh, makes an interesting point there because it's, I mean, just to, by observation here, verse two, the multitude is following, be, following him because they saw the signs which he performed on those who were diseased. <clears throat> and this is a different, this is something uh, they knew if, if uh, the multitude came to him and they were all lepers or uh, the multitude came to him and they all uh, were lame. Uh, I guess they wouldn't be coming to him, but regardless, um, he, they understand the disease part, but now he, he makes a different point about that. You know, also back in John chapter 2, we saw that Jesus is the Lord of quality. 
by the uh, changing of water into wine. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they didn't have to do that. Yeah. But still, it did not occur to them that he could multiply loaves and fishes. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the whole thing is, you, uh, with all these miracles, and that's what I love about John. Uh, with, with all these miracles, he he just establishes, he's God. You know, he's able to do everything, and 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 over time he establishes that. Uh, and by the way, we know that he's going to repeat this miracle. Uh, it's just not recorded in John the second time. Right. Yeah. All right, let's see. So, in order to feed these people, according to whatever you would put to a denarii to be a day's wage, one note said eight months' wages would not even be enough to feed them all and then be filled sufficiently. And so, Andrew, one of si or Simon Peter's brother, makes the point that there is a fella here. There's a lad who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? thought that was interesting you know here's some and, and of all people to have food this lad does he he has it and so jesus says make the people sit down by the way do you think the fish were already preserved as in like salted do you yeah. think he was carrying them on a string <laughs> he presumably had them for his lunch yeah i mean you wouldn't need the bread unless the fish had already been prepared uh the, you got now the bread and the meat, the fish to eat. This is this is his lunch. Perhaps he's yeah. out there about to fish some more. Perhaps he's just uh, going from one place to another. But uh, I would I would say that the fish had already been uh, prepared, uh, salted, or uh, dried at the very least, or whatever. And, Paul, were uh, you picturing Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn like me? Walking yeah. up carrying some fish, yeah. Yeah, that's how I saw it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I think Bob, you're right. It's probably his lunch that he was bringing, you know, best, you know, carrying. So Jesus says, make people sit down. So they, of course they sat down. And it says the men here sat down was number about 5,000. Any interesting comments about that? The word men here is gender okay. specific. Okay. So that does not include the women and children who may be there. I mean, surely there were women there also who, who were who were fed, and so it's possible if 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 these were couples, uh, each with a child, then that would could be as many as fifteen thousand people. Uh, and so we we just don't know. It's just a a great multitude, five thousand men. Again, plus whatever women and children were were there, and that gives us an idea of the of the of why it would take two hundred denarii or eight months' salary, as somebody said, uh, to feed them all. Yeah, and, and that would only be a little bit. That would not be a feast. That's right. Yeah. Anyone. That would just everybody would have some lunch, basically. Yeah, maybe get back town, back to town. Yep. You, you know, uh, uh, Bob, you, uh, you know, in, in bringing up a point about this, you've got 5,000 people. I'm not even sure that eight months worth would be enough to feed 5,000, <laughs> you know, uh, but, 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 you know, here's an interesting thing, you know, uh, this is my, this is my apologetic mind working. Uh, when I say apologetic, not I'm sorry, but evidences, <laughs> uh, you know, when you when you think about it and you look at all the miracles that we have recorded, it could easily be said that Jesus performed miracles and more than 10,000 people saw those miracles. At any one time. Yeah. Well, well, I, yeah, not now, but I'm saying overall during his life. Yeah. More than 10,000 people witnessed one type of a miracle or number and that's or, or another. And that's just the ones we have recorded. You have 5,000 here, and like uh, like Bob said, only the men are mentioned. You have 4,000 on another. There's almost 10,000 right there. Paul talks about Jesus appearing to 500 at one time. And, and you start calculating all of all the miracles, uh, people that were around and so on. 
more than 10,000 people witnessed the miracles that he performs. So, I mean, and, and that was in, and, and by the way, that was just in one region. So, uh, so that's a, that's a, a powerful point that a skeptic has a problem getting around. You know, something else I was, I was thinking, uh, that this 200 denarii, I would buy them a little lunch, but that was not enough. Is what Philip is saying. Yeah. 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a, a little. So presumably they, they could scrape together that much money, but it wouldn't, it, but wouldn't be enough to feed so many. Mm, and then the, the lad has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they so of them so many? So, so even what food they have would not be sufficient uh, to feed such a crowd as this, which would be uh, an understatement to say the least. Well, real quick here, um, let's bring kind of the, 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 the pinnacle of this miracle. Jesus takes the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. Now, this seems like such a very simple statement here. All Jesus did is took the, took the loaves, and he gave thanks for them, just like we would sit down at our meal and we thank the Lord for the food that we have. But I would love to have seen this, you know, whatever the basket was, five loaves and two fish, they would put their hand in and pick it out, put their hand in, distribute it, you know, yeah, yeah, or did the baskets themselves multiply? I mean, it's, it's just, there's no way of knowing exactly the details of it, but they were able to distribute to these thousands of people enough food so that when everything was said and done, all they wanted, likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted, the text says there. And then as I already talked about earlier, when they gathered up the fragments, there were 12 baskets filled with fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had not eaten. You know, this is kind of reminiscent of Elijah. Yes. Yeah. And the, yeah. the, the little bit of meal and the a little jar of oil mm -hmm. and but the Lord sustained three people on that over a period of three years. Uh, yeah. th at the widow, she was about ready to just make the last meal for herself and her son. Then they were going to starve to death. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but because she uh, was hospitable to Elijah, God rewarded her and her son with that sustenance. It's interesting that Jesus, while he does these miracles to show who he is, and he does these miracles to uh, give faith, he doesn't, well, while doing all of that, he doesn't grandstand. Uh, I think I, the human side of me would have been tempted to say, all right, bring me the fish, uh, bring me the loaves, and you got to see what I'm going to do. Uh, yeah. But, you know, Jesus is not like, sit back and behold the power, you know, or, or anything like that. Uh, Jesus just, uh, in his normal, um, I think about when, when Paul uh, talked to the Philippians about uh, how he humbled himself and he was obedient. That here, you know, in a very humble but straightforward faith-instilling way, uh, Jesus... Uh, works this great miracle. So, And that's such a contrast to those who claim to be working miracles today. Yes. They, they got to put their name out there and, you know, come one, come all, we're going to have a mass healing. I remember talking to my uncle years ago. He was a Baptist preacher. And I asked him once why he was not impressed with Oral Roberts and that sort of thing. And he said, well, he said, I went to one tent meeting of Oral Roberts and there was a storm and the tent fell and they had to call ambulances to tote the people to the hospital. He says, if, if uh, Oral Roberts had all that power, they wouldn't have needed to take them to the hospital. And, uh, but you know, you, you've got the grandstanding as, uh, as Paul pointed out among men today who claimed to, to, to yeah. do that thing. That's a good point. 
That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. I didn't know about the, the case in point, what you're talking about there. But what an easy way of can, at least if someone's going to believe based on a miracle, what an easy way to do it. Powerful way. Yeah. Go down to the hospital, start healing people, make the police yeah. come drag you out and, and charge you with trespassing because you're costing the hospital money by healing all these people. Yeah. And by the way, while you're at it, go downstairs and empty the morgue. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, oh, by the way, um, they, so one of the apostles here apparently had worked for, um, a local restaurant there that was a precursor to one of our, uh, was it Lambert's here? And uh, that's how they distributed the bread to so many people. He was throwing the loaves to them. Okay, sorry. Never mind. This is serious stuff now. No joking. This is serious. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of smoke and mirrors. Yeah. But no, really, what, what got me thinking there, I was trying to picture in my mind, you know, actually what the, the loaves of barley looked like. And when, and you think about it, everyone was filled. So did he hand out a full loaf to every person every time his hand went in? Sometimes we think about them like tearing them apart and distributing it that way. But people were filled. Yeah. So as yeah. they walked they by and put their hand them. in, you know, they would have bought out a, a, a loaf, fish. I mean, it's just incredible, incredible to stop and picture what it would have been like to have been there. Right. And, and do you know what the, uh, at least I've heard one of the uh, naturalistic arguments for this, you know, those that want to, kind of sort of believe the Bible, but they don't believe all the yeah. miracles and stuff. What's that? They something happened. What they say happened here is this was a communal type of a thing that a lot of people had brought their meals with them. And when Jesus prayed and you had this one loaf, everybody started sharing with each other. And uh, when they got done, they had the 12 baskets of leftovers. So actually everybody was prepared when they came. I, 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 this is the argument. This is the argument that's made. This is the stretch that people will go to to explain away something or to try to give it a natural, a natural explanation. Wow. Yeah. Either you believe the Bible or you don't. Yeah, and, and that's the point. You know, clearly you don't believe the Bible. If if that's your approach, you you don't believe the Bible. I mean, these are they're written in such a way. There's little things in these in the gospels uh, about these miracles there's little details all through the the gospels that dismiss the naturalistic arguments i i mean just, just little statements here and there you know i, I mean i mean you, you 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 look at you look at this one uh, uh the they make the point, you know, it's not enough to feed everybody. They're making the observation. There is not enough to feed these people. How long had they been there? Those kinds of things. You know, Tom, I forgot to read this next section. So go ahead. And since, since we're already discussing it, read for us, if you would, verses 10 through 14. I apologize for that. We just went, kept right on going. Okay. All right. Okay, well, uh, in verse number 10, we read there, Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number, about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to the disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the, the fragments of the five barley loaves, which they left, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. All right. Thank you, Tom. So we've already talked about most of this last section here, but I do want to kind of bring up verse 14 real quick. The, the conclusion that the men, now I'm assuming that those men are talking about the ones who were fed, you know, the, the, the crowd there and everything. When they seen the sign that Jesus did, now Tom, this goes back to what you were talking about a while ago. 
if everybody had brought their own food and the apostles were just blind to that fact that everybody had a big old knapsack of food with them and everything, um, then there would be no reason for them to be this impressed with Jesus. You know, and so in this case of point, they saw this, their conclusion is truly, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Now, John uses the term the prophet. Is this not just a prophet, but do you think the point behind this is of prophecy, the one that was prophesied, such as Moses foretold, this is who they're referencing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this is the Messiah prophet. they're looking for. I I, yeah. I think that's the point. That the, they see that he's the Messiah. They don't understand how, but 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 he's this prophet. And more than like when they say the prophet, more than like I think it's the Deuteronomy eighteen, fifteen. Um, yes. But incidentally, you know, building on that in verse thirteen, and this is again when you read the the when you read the specifics of the text, it says when they gathered up, they filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves yeah. so i mean again the, the text makes it clear that this wasn't a communal meal it was the fight you know i mean uh, he he emphasizes it was the scraps from what they started with and Tom, you know, is it something for every apostle to take home a basket with them to eat extra later yeah, there, there you go. Yeah, so so hey, you you've got your dinner covered tonight too. So, you know, another thing is that uh, it hadn't occurred to me until today, or if it had occurred to me at all, I'd long forgotten it. Uh, the gathered up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves. There were no fragments of fish left over. This would give you the, a relative idea of the size of the. These are. Uh, these are not big catfish. Uh, these are, are small fish where, like like you would say, and like we have already made mention of, this was the lunch of this young boy. They were probably small fish. You could eat a couple of small fish. You would finish them off. But uh, the barley loaves, yeah, you, you might not be able to eat one more full barley loaf. And so there would be fragments of those left, uh, of those left over. Yeah. And so let's not get, let them go to waste. And so let's yeah. gather that. Um, comment real quick. Caleb says the title leading the 5,000 is so misleading. One, it says about 5,000 and two, we were just counting men. And I think this was touched on earlier, maybe by Bob. Clearly there were many more than 5,000 should put the feeding of more than 5,000. Yeah. Good point. Good point. All right. Let's see. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments about this? So sim, sim, Paul, we talked about symbolism earlier. What would be a good symbolic message? If I can, if I'm using the right word symbolism that would go along with this miracle. Uh, the abundance that Jesus is able to provide. Maybe uh, I don't, I'm not sure what you were thinking. But um, that he is, um, he came to give life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Uh, one passage uh, that's a rough paraphrase of that. And well, uh, here the, is the, uh, the bread of life. Yeah. A little bit the, later, he will talk about him being the bread of life. Yeah, in this chapter. Serves. Yeah. Yeah. When yeah, you in trust in him, there is sustainability. Yeah. Uh, he's Over. able to provide all that you need. Yeah, over an abundance of what we need is always there. And not only that, but the gospel. The gospel is going to be for everyone, for every, you know, for all people who will ever who will come to him. And so how little they they'll sow a little, but yet there will be a great reaping that will be done as well. I was thinking Bob, about uh, oh, oh, go ahead, Bob, and then I'll I'll go. I'm just gonna say, and when we get into this next section, there's an even uh uh, there's another application that could be made of, of this uh, miraculous feeding mm -hmm. uh, uh, far more than was necessary uh, to sustain yeah. these people. It's a good point. Yeah. Paul said in Ephesians 3, um, verse 20, uh, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above 
all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. And he goes on to talk about uh, glory to him. But I, I, I'm always impressed with that uh, extreme statement of what uh, Jesus is able to do. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above. Uh, and so even what we could think of. So uh, he, he shows himself here uh, with exactly that. Excellent point. Excellent point. All right. Let me check on the time here real quick. Tell you what, let me throw this up just by way of reminder. If you hear something that we say that maybe you have a question regarding, or maybe you disagree with us, we'd love to hear from you. You can send your questions and comments to questions at truthfactorlive.com, or you can email us individually. Just use the short version of our first name. You'll see the screen there, John, Paul, Tom, Bob, etc at truthfactor.com and we should assuming everything still works we will receive your email and hear what you have to say about it and if it pertains to our study then we'll do our best then to bring it back into our study the following week all right any thoughts you know i really want us to look at verse 15 even if we don't look at the rest of the context because i think verse 15 goes as much with the previous uh context as it does with the following context we'll go ahead and uh, read it bob uh it says therefore when jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king he departed again to a mountain by himself alone and so they are so impressed with with this miracle they think well he could feed an army on a shoestring budget this is the man we want as our king. But apparently there was some uh, unwillingness on the part of Jesus. They were going to force, force him, uh, use, take him by force and make him a king. Uh, but the kind of king they wanted was a, a geopolitical king that would lead them in revolt against the Roman Empire which was not the kind of king that he came to be. And he explains that uh, by his, uh, uh, his sermon on this occasion. But what do they do when they bring him to Pilate? They accuse him of being the kind of king they wanted, but that he had refused to be. <laughs> because I mean, they knew point. the only way they could get him crucified. Yeah, that's a good point. Any other thoughts about that? I think this is probably a good stopping point right. before we get into yeah. the next section here. But I think that's a good observation that Bob made about verse 15. Yeah, by the way, j just building on what Bob just said mm -hmm. there real quick. It's in the Gospel of John where that happens. So so here you have them, you know, the same gospel, same gospel where they're wanting to make him king now. And then later on, they accuse him of wanting to be a king. Because yeah. John's the one that deals with it. The conversation that is right yeah. so he's setting us he's setting the reader up for that by yeah, making, yeah. absolutely Good. now i have a completely random thought not well, you 90 80 percent random <laughs> you know we we fully believe in the inspiration of the holy spirit inspiring the apostles to write and even the inspired writers, such as like Matt, um, Luke and um, Mark, who I'm thinking about specifically. But John, in this case in point, you wonder if he wrote it like what we would write it today. In other words, we would outline it. Most people, if they're going to write something of this lengthy, they would outline it. They would kind of sketch out what it is they want to cover and show. And, may, and, it, and it is an intentional connecting of the dots. Um, at least it seems that way. And so I, I really think that my suspicion is with that inspiration, the Holy Spirit used the intellectual ability of the writer to develop and to formulate. And, and that's why, like Hebrews, when we read through Hebrews, why it reads so cleanly and, and so much in perfect order of the things that it's trying to convey. You know, we kind of picture time someone just sitting down and start scribbling and everything. But I, I have to believe that there was intent and design within their own mind being inspired by the spirit to share the information in a way that makes sense yeah right. and and understand there there could have been some forethought you know uh, you know I, I i'm talking about I with the so. individuals 
You yeah, know, I, mean, I believe so. I mean, uh, 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 like you said, I mean, uh, like I said, we we sometimes will will outline and then fill in fill in the outline, and yeah. and and there could have been some of that with this, and um, uh, the Holy Spirit, He could have guided them through that entire process. You know, I've 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 heard some people argue, uh, or, or at least some of the arguments made about the idea of they got together and they coordinated and so on. Or they will say, or they will say that Matthew and Luke copied from Mark and some other source that we don't have. They call it Q, and and uh, um, and they say that there was a source that they used. You know what? It's possible. Yeah. It's possible that Matthew did have a copy of Luke. That doesn't change anything. I mean, he he still wrote independent of Luke or, or uh, of Mark. He writes a lot in there that's not in Mark, and and if and if Luke, who talked about former accounts, had it, so, you know, so, so, uh, that doesn't change that it's inspiration, especially when you find that they're independent with the various yeah. facts that they bring out. Because and, you know, so I, no. Bob, we see this more particularly, I think, in in Luke. We got Luke one one through mm -hmm. four where he. He says, all right, I'm going to, I follow this. I'm going to follow this in an orderly fashion now, because I really want you to understand the things that you've been taught are true. But then in the book of Acts, Acts 1 verse 8, he tells uh, the disciples, you're going to carry the gospel uh, to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And that seems to me to be an outline Luke uses in Acts because he starts with Jerusalem and goes into Judea, then Samaria, and then when he introduces the Apostle Paul and Paul and Barnabas, take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth, Paul and Barnabas and Silas, in the uh, three missionary journeys. Right, yeah, exactly right. And you know, the Luke 1.1, 1, 1, the very first verse, inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled, mm -hmm. he's 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 making the point that um, it's already been said. You know, you know, yeah. uh, others have said these things, but I want to put them in order. So I mean, so he's 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 writing independently. Uh, I mean, uh, of of the other, yes, he has sources in front of him. Uh, but he's writing independently. Well, we, and, we do the, the same thing today. Okay. Yeah. How many preachers write the same article on the same subject? And when I mean same article, I mean, it's, it's the same body of information. Ideas. Same, exactly. Yeah. Same scriptures. I'm thinking, you know, if you're going to write an, an article on the miracle in Cana, you could probably find a sound brother that's already covered that. But there is a need within our own selves to do to re, to do the work again, because it helps us to exercise our knowledge, and it helps to convey to our body of people who were teaching and everything. Um, well, so but well, wait, one writer may see something that that the other yeah. writer did. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and by the way, if you write something that somebody else hasn't written about. That's the one where you need to pause and take a second look. I mean, I, I'm not saying it may not be true, or I, I, but that's when you need to pause. Uh, you know, I mean, if this is something completely that I've never heard before, you know, maybe I need to think about this. So. <laughs> yeah. if, if it's true, it's not new. If it's new, it's not true. Paul, what are you going to say? Okay. I so didn't have Two, two things real quick. Years ago, I like to tell this, this, this story on myself. I studied King James Version for a long time, and I was hurriedly trying to write questions in the story of Samson. And um, my, my, my question was, how, you know, I can't remember, I think it was, did, did, Samson have, did Samson have any children? And so I just wrote it out because the Bible says what it says. And as we were reading the questions in class, I finally looked at it when one of the members said, where did Samson have any children? I said, it's right there in that verse. It says, Samson took a kid. And then I realized what he was talking about. Um, but you know, were talking about pulling from other sources. This is done in the Old Testament. 
the whole collection of First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and probably First and Second Samuel. A lot of that was compiled from books that had been written. And Chronicles talks about that, doesn't it? When he, he'll reference a point and says, now, these things are also written in the book of Jasper or whatever, you know, as, as, as example. And so it's not uncommon for people to collect information. And that information was inspired, let's say, and pull it into, by inspiration, their, their collection. So, right. it's, it's yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, the, the Chronicle letters are very... Uh, are, are, are very full of legal documents. You know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm finishing up a study of the book of Nehemiah. I'll finish it on Sunday. And uh, we've gone through Ezra and Nehemiah, and there is just so much in there that clearly they had records that they appealed to as this was put together. And it is believed by some that, and I don't necessarily believe it, it is believed by some that both Ezra and Nehemiah were written by the same individual. And when you've got the first person declarations that they're quoting, they're quoting yeah. documents and they're just putting everything together. Some say that Ezra wrote all of them. Interesting. Later on. And being a scribe, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, being a scribe. And Ezra is actually described by Jews, by some Jews as a second Moses. Interesting. Uh, after the restoration because he comes along and he restores the law. And so anyways, but that's, that's a whole nother point. We're out of time. So it's a good point though. All right. Well, listen, let's plan next week to pick up right around verse 16. Um, in our reading, John chapter six, there in verse number 16, we'll continue that next Thursday, Lord willing. Um, so be sure if you're on our Facebook page, you're watching us there to what is it? A follow. And like the page, if you would, if you're on our YouTube channel, then be sure to like the video and subscribe. That way you can receive future notifications of when we go live. All righty, guys, I appreciate y'all being here and I appreciate you for joining us for our study today. Be sure to contact us if you have any questions or comments, questions at truthfactorlive.com. All right, we'll see everyone ne oh, next Thursday. Have a great week.